In this video, I'm going to be discussing the escalation model of multiple sclerosis and why it's flawed. If you'd like to better understand my beef with the escalation model and what I think works better to take care of people with MS, stay tuned, because I'm going to explain it right now. Howdy. Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I started this YouTube channel to help my own MS clinic patients learn between clinic visits, and it's my hope that through these videos, I can help you learn too. Today's topic is the escalation model of multiple sclerosis and why I feel it's flawed. I'll first explain what it's about, I'll then explain why I don't think it works properly, and at the end of the video, I'll share with you what I think works a lot better. So let's dig in. The escalation model in MS works like this. We start a patient with MS on a medicine that is lower in efficacy, but has a very nice safety tolerability profile. And if that patient does well and doesn't have attacks or new spots, then we're an awesome doctor and they're an awesome patient and that's an awesome MS drug and all is well. But if things don't work out and there's some disease activity, well, then we'll upgrade the medicine to something that we feel might be more effective in treating the disease but the side effect profile might be less attractive. The rationale to the escalation model is it's the perfect risk benefit. We don't want to subject the person with MS to undue risk, so the model says. And if we can match the proper patient to the proper drug, well then we can hit that right balance. And if someone with MS doesn't have a lot of concerning risk factors, which would predict that they're going to go on and have very nasty disease, well, then we don't have to subject them to nasty drugs with bad side effects. We might get away with using a lower efficacy drug with a better side effect profile. That's hogwash. It doesn't make sense to me, and I disagree. And I'd like to spend the next few minutes explaining to you why. Number one, when we say with the escalation model that we start you on a drug, and if nothing bad happens, we keep you on it, it's kind of that old expression, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We have to very carefully analyze what it ain't broke means. Because if all you're looking at are obvious clinical attacks, like I'm having trouble walking, you're going to miss a lot of clinical disease activity, like loss of cognitive function and pathologic fatigue. If you're only looking at new spots on the MRI, you might completely miss accelerated brain atrophy. My point here is that we are at risk of missing disease activity. We are at risk of allowing the person to have slippage of their disease under our watch. We spend in the clinic 15 to 45 minutes with a patient, and we may do that twice to four times a year. They may get an MRI once a year. I submit to you that we might not pick up every single new neurological problem with those time constraints and the limits of those resources. Moreover, a lot of the damage in MS, particularly in the first five years, is invisible. I'm talking about legit brain damage that hasn't manifested clinically. And so someone who is undertreated, they're not treated adequately on a low efficacy drug, might not have an attack and they might not have a new spot on the MRI, but they, they may be having damage, which is going to become a problem clinically down the line. You see, not all of the MS drugs work the same. And I'll use atrophy or brain shrinkage as an example. After the age of 18, all of our brains are supposed to get smaller, just like as you age, your skin gets thinner. But people with MS untreated can have very rapid accelerated brain shrinkage, sometimes five or ten times faster than normal. Now, MS drugs can slow down this brain shrinkage, but they don't all do it the same. Some of them do it better than others, and in fact, the first-line medicines are not awesome at slowing brain shrinkage. And so, this first point of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, is very concerning, because you might not know that it's broke. My second concern has to do with the idea, well, if it doesn't work out, then we'll escalate the drug. What does it doesn't work out mean? It doesn't work out means that we allowed the person to accrue brain damage. We allowed inflammatory attacks on the central nervous system, the holiest of holies, the supercomputer that runs the body, the superhighway, the spinal cord, and those are unreplaceable organs. We can't transplant them. We allowed them to accrue inflammatory damage, which is brain damage. So that doesn't make sense to me because I can't give it back. 
I can't say, ooh, sorry about that brain damage and reverse it. Therefore, I'm very concerned about allowing it to occur. On this channel, I've discussed clinical trials, which demonstrate that when you have an MS attack, you don't always bounce back. And you might, for example, go blind in your left eye because of an optic neuritis, God forbid. And you may regain only half the function. You have a crude neurological disability. And that's what they mean when they say if it doesn't work out. So why do we have to allow patients to accrue neurological disability before we escalate their therapy? That confuses me. Problem number three has to do with the use of risk factors. Now, a very common way of practicing MS, and we all do this, I do this, is to look at risk factors for aggressive disease. There are certain characteristics of a given human being which would predispose them to be more likely to have a bad time, to have a rapid disease course, or a steeper decline in function. They're not going to do as well. And if you identify risk factors, that might be rationale for escalating faster or starting with a more effective therapy. For example, you might see an archetypical African-American male with spinal cord disease who incompletely recovered from an attack and was left with neurological deficits. He's at higher risk long-term of having a worse disease course than an archetypical Caucasian woman who had a very small burden of disease on her MRI, no spinal cord lesions, had a sensory attack, and fully recovered without steroids. So she, this archetypical example, is less likely to have an aggressive disease course. And so the, the common way of thinking is to say we might put the uh, higher risk patient on a higher risk drug. Higher risk meaning maybe more efficacious, but more risk uh, from side effects or tolerability or safety. And we might put the person who has a lower risk on a less effective drug, but, it ha but that way we don't subject them to undue side effects. Well, wait a second. What if the person who has mild risk factors doesn't want to have disease activity? What if the person with mild disease uh, risk factors doesn't want any brain damage? Why are they not eligible to be considered or to discuss highly effective therapies? Number four, I've heard people say that we should use lower efficacy medicines first because they're less expensive and that the newer, more efficacious medicines are more expensive. And that's not always true. You might be amazed in the American markets to look at the price of the shots. They are the same price as the pills, and in fact, they're more expensive than some of the infusions. And so it is a fallacy to assume that by escalating, you're saving money. This doesn't even get into the cost of allowing someone to become disabled. By using a low efficacy medicine early on, if that person goes on to develop disability, that costs the human, their family, and our, our community a tremendous amount. And number five, the tenet that the more effective drugs are more dangerous and have a worse side effect profile isn't exactly true. It's leaving out the fact that by practicing good medicine, by being a good neurologist, we can mitigate some of that risk. I'm not selling snake oil and saying there aren't risks. There are. But we can mitigate many of them by doing a good job. The bottom line is, the escalation model, in my opinion, puts a version of risk of side effects over efficacy of treating the condition. And that doesn't feel right to me. I would like to propose something that I think is genuinely better. Instead of embracing an escalation model, why don't MS neurologists do the following? Ask the patient to go on the single most effective drug as early as possible that they're comfortable with. Now, the problem is this takes work. But if I explain to you the most effective drug that you're eligible for, and I tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly, and you agree to take it, we're done. And we've now grappled with the risk benefit for you. We've kept the risk of the drug inside the context of the risk of the disease. And we've matched your individual risk benefit tolerance. If the human being says, no doc, I'm not comfortable with that. Okay, well then you can de-escalate. You can go down a notch and tell them about a drug that might not be as effective, but still very, very effective. And you can talk about the side effect profile, the risk, the benefit, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And if they like that medicine, then start on that one. To me, this makes more sense. 
by matching the patient with the most effective option that they're eligible for and comfortable with. Now, the reality is the escalation model is by far the most utilized model to treat MS. What I'm saying is aberrant. It's not normal. And I feel like the escalation model is wrong. But I would love to hear what you think. I love this growing online community. You guys are awesome. I love reading the comments, and I particularly love it when I see subscribers interacting with one another in the comments. That is so awesome. Please do me a favor and take a moment and share your own opinions, your thoughts, um, what you think about this topic of escalation. Leave it down in the comments below, and I look forward to reading it, and I'll answer. Now, before I tune off, I want to point out that I've got a microphone. One of the subscribers left me a comment and said, hey, Aaron, your sound sucks. And he was right. So I'm slowly learning how to do this uh, YouTube stuff, and I'm now using a microphone. So I hope the sound sounds better. And do me a favor and leave a comment about whether it sounds better or not down below. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to my channel. It makes me feel awesome, and it's really, really cool to watch this community grow. You can do that by clicking the little red button. And until my next video, take care.